Well, hello everyone. Thank you for joining me for Living Room Live. This is an awesome day that we get to know Jesus and study His Word. I hope you've joined me with your Bible and your notebook today because um, write down these verses. It's important to study the Word of God. It isn't just hearing information. It's really meditating on it, letting it become yours, getting it down in your heart, reading the verses before and after, and just checking things out. You may want to run some other references also, which is really beneficial for all of us. So let's go ahead and start off with prayer. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Father, for opening the eyes of our understanding that we might know and understand what you're speaking to our hearts today. Thank you for what you're doing on this earth. I thank you for this great awakening. Father, I just ask that you would encourage men, women, and children to participate and be involved with what you're doing. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Well, I hope you've been having a wonderful week. I believe your blessings are gonna, God's blessings are on this next week for you. Um, be excited about living life to the fullest because we make a choice whether we want to live in the mully grubs, whichever that, whatever that means, I'm not sure. Sometimes I hear these phrases that came from my mom or from other people like mully grubs and um, various things and um, but we don't want to live where we're depressed. We don't want to live where we are always feeling like a victim instead of a victor, where we feel like we're just, um, just God just stuck, stuck us in his family because he had to. He didn't purpose to love us because those things aren't true. And we are not going to be living in lies and deceit. I want to talk about today about being misinformed. I have a story to tell you. I'll try to make it quick so we can get into the scriptures. But we're having company come and we're excited about that. And um, I've been putting up with some things here at the house, trying to battle it on, on our own, trying to figure out how to take care of this, how to take care of that. And it's as funny as it sounds, it's been an ant problem. We have had a major ant infestation in our home, on our property. You couldn't walk outside to go water or do things because ants would just swarm and get all over my feet. I'd be watering the plants and ants would just crawl on my feet. I'm doing this, this crazy stomping around trying to get them off my feet and rushing around trying to do watering and get off the grass really quickly. And then the other day I had um, three of my grandkids over and we came into the house. And so while we were in the house, it was time to leave to take the kids home. I was loading them, going to load them up in the car. And I had already unlocked the car and I was gathering my things. They were going in front of me towards the car. And I saw them doing the funniest dancing with their feet. I thought, oh, that looks so cute. And I realized they were doing an ant dance also. They had joined me with an ant dance because they... Well, Gracie didn't want to step on the ant, so she's trying to jump over them and do this funny little dance, and she's screaming and hollering, and Ethan's doing this, you know, kind of maneuvering around them. And, of course, then I have my youngest grandson, and he is the ant stomper of all time. He goes just, he's looking for ants to stomp them, to, to get them out of the way. Well, if they're on the driveway and they're on the grass, well, we've had situations with ants in the house. They're looking for water or whatever it is. Um, but in the bathroom, um, my tile, my bathroom, you can't see things so much on that tile. And it's, you know, it's got a print on it. So you have to look really close because all of a sudden the print starts to move a little bit or shift a little bit and you realize there's ants in my bathroom and there was ants in the other bathroom. And then there's ants continually in the kitchen on this on that you have to wipe it off and do this and do that and I'm having to prepare food over in another area because the ants have have arrived so we've put out drops we've sprayed we've done all these things we've sprayed around the house and it didn't seem to be helping at all so because we were having company I went ahead and I thought I've had it so I called a, I called a company to come out and spray well I have the date, they're going to be coming out to spray, and I'm so glad to get rid of the ants and um, anything else that might be crawling and moving around our household or our yard area. 
but I noticed I had an email from this company telling me what I had to do to prepare to have them come to spray for the first time. So it had a list of things and as I, and I thought, oh well, it's okay, I'll just make sure they can spray around the windows and doors. And then as I read their instruction, they told me I had to clear everything out of the cupboards, I, you know, under the sinks, in the bathrooms, and out the cupboards in the bathrooms. Take everything out. I don't know about how your bathroom cupboards are, but mine have been stuffed. We've lived here for over 35 years, and probably some of the cupboards in the very back I haven't seen for 35 years. Maybe not quite that bad. But I, I put stuff in my cupboards, and if I don't need them right away, year after year, they just stay stuck in the back of a cupboard. So now I'm pulling everything out of cupboards. I'm clearing things out. I'm putting things in the, in the bathtub out of the, out of the cabinets and everything. And so then in my kitchen, I have to pull out all food items. That means all my spices, all my, you know, every food, everything in there. Plus it said, and all of your serving ware, your dinner ware, your cooking, your mixing bowls and everything everything out of my cabinets. I thought, I did not sign up for this. But it was needful and they were coming the next day so I started that whole day. It took me hours to pull everything out. I had to put everything on my dining room table and then cover up my, put them in plastic bags and then cover up everything with towels or sheets or something. So came that morning, here he was. He was right on time, came right on time. He walked in, I said, I hope everything's fine. There's a few things I've left in my cabinets because I'm going to wash those anyway before I use those again. Oh, like maybe crock pots and various things I don't use very often. I'll wash that before I use it anyway. He looks at me and he says, oh, what a shame. He said, I'm surprised they haven't changed that or taken it off because we're not using that spray any longer that can get into food or on your plates and, and hurt you. This is totally... Um, pet free, people free, kids free, and so on. So he explained as that he did that, my mind is thinking about the time I've taken to pull everything out. The time it's gonna take me to wash down every cabinet. The time it's gonna take me to put everything back. Think, well, this is a good thing. I get to sort things out. Well, when you're in a hurry, you don't do much sorting. You just do a lot of, of being irritated because now I didn't have to do all that. Did it hurt me to do it? No, it didn't hurt, but it cost me time. It cost me effort. And you know, when you're getting ready for something, we're having some meetings at our church, and so there's preparation, there's things to do and, and, and such. I didn't have extra time on my hands, and somehow I found that time where it took me hours before and hours later, and a dumpster full of things I was throwing away because I didn't need them. And I got something accomplished, but I didn't have to. It was a waste of time. I was misinformed. And so we've been misinformed about a lot of things. And I won't go into some of those areas in our lives that we've been misinformed, but boy, with the Word of God, there's been a lot of misinformation. And we need to go ahead and find out what we're supposed to be doing and how we're supposed to be doing it. You know, if you'll go ahead and you'll take the owner's manual, the Word of God, and you find out how to apply the Word of God, how to use the Word of God. What does God really say? Not what are other people saying. You will be so far ahead of everything. I'd like for you to go ahead and look in Hosea chapter 4, and we're going to look at verse 6. I love Hosea chapter 4, verse 6. It says, My people, this, this is God talking about, His people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And then it goes on to say, because you've rejected knowledge. You haven't had the right information. I was misinformed about what I had to do to prepare to have my house sprayed safely. And I wanted to make sure it was safe. Not only did I want it ant free, but I didn't want any, any stuff around. I didn't want to have it be dangerous for somebody to be eating off my plates and so on. But I was misinformed. I, I, one of the drawers I went through when I was clearing everything out was a drawer that had a lot of this information in it. These are books. I have one about my um, sink, about my faucets. I have another one. I have a KitchenAid, and here's this information about my KitchenAid. And then we have some furniture ones. And then how about this one? It's called the Pancake Compressor. Has all this, all this information. 
correct information about it. And then I love this one. This is, in fact, I threw the one away about my refrigerator, but it was still sealed in plastic like this one is about my gas grill. Obviously, I have not felt the need to find out any, any information. And I had this great big one about um, my refrigerator. Well, I don't know how many years old my refrigerator is. I still had the booklet sealed in plastic, never opened it up. I mean, my goodness, what do you have to know? Plug her in, make sure the water supply is, is to the, the ice cube maker and so on. What do you need to know about a refrigerator? How much do you have to know about it? Well, there was information, all this good information about the different things I have. And that's good and I kept some of it because we might be needing it. But there is information in the Word of God about you. There's information about God. There's information about the devil. There's information about these end times. And it's so important to get into the Word of God about all these things and not to be misinformed because misinformation can cost you your time. It can cost you um, many things. Misinformation about God's will to heal can keep you sick. sick. If you don't know that it is always the will of God to heal you, then you might question whether you can be healed today. What are we looking at? How are we finding out and discovering what the truth is? Do we just listen to some misinformation, some misguided people that have the wrong information on an email, on YouTube, on television? There's been a lot of misinformation. I watched a program one time. I was um, I had just listened to another program by Kenneth Copeland. It was really good. And I kept the TV on. It was a Christian station. And I was cleaning my living room and such. But here the TV was still on and this gentleman was on. He was talking about how it's good to believe God. And it's good to, to have faith in God. But you've got to go out and do things to earn what God has for you. Who are you to think that you could could deserve to be born into God's kingdom without doing good works. Like, whoa, wait a second. My hand was so quick to go to that button and turn that off because that's not true. Because it is by grace you are saved through faith. It's not of works lest we boast. And that was some, in, mis, some misinformation that was coming across a station that is a Christian station, but that was misinformation. And how about a testimony from somebody saying, oh, God made me sick to put me in the hospital next to this gentleman or this woman so I could witness to them and pray for them. Well, you were given two feet. God could have said, go to the hospital. And in this room is somebody who needs prayer. And you could have on your feet gone and ministered to that person. And how much of a greater witness to go in healthy than to go in sick, being wheeled in and to witness to someone. God laid our sickness and our disease and our pain on Jesus. Not on ourselves, but on Jesus. Don't think that you are going to be taking what Jesus um, took, what he was put upon him to help somebody. That is not the gospel. The gospel is the goodness of God causes men to come to repentance. So let's get it straight. Don't be full of misinformation. You are born again because of what Jesus did. You are healed because of what Jesus did for you. All of these things. You're made prosperous because of what Jesus did for you. That he took your poverty and through his poverty you might be made rich. Not through our poverty. God wants us doing well in every area. Well, I'm sure Jesus was depressed and sometimes and he put depression on me so I could understand. I could understand how other people feel. Throw that off. That is misinformation. That is not the truth. So let's go ahead and turn to John chapter 8 in our Bibles today. Thank you, Jesus. We're talking about being misinformed. And I don't like to be lied to, and I don't like to have misinformation. This gentleman that, that worked for this company was so kind. The first thing he was, he said, I am so sorry that you put in so much effort and had to do so much work for something you didn't have to do. Well, I am so sorry if you're watching this today and you felt like God is putting things on you so you could understand how he feels, that if you can understand how other people feel. God has compassion. He puts compassion and understanding in us by His Spirit, not by our circumstances. 
I've heard people say, well, if I didn't, if I hadn't been an alcoholic, I never could have understand al alcoholics. By the Spirit of God, you can understand everything. You don't have to be a prostitute to understand the bondage. You don't have to be um, put down and, and oppressed to understand what a, what a terrible thing that is to live under pressure, under guilt and condemnation. Jesus experienced that, those things for us so that he could set his people free. He was punished when he did not deserve punishment. He had so many things laid upon him so we would be free from those. The redemptive work of God is completed through Jesus. He doesn't need us suffering to complete that redemptive work. We follow in life and life abundantly. I hope this is ministering to your hearts today. We're partakers of his nature, of the things he gave to us. So in John chapter 8, and in the middle of verse 44, it talks about Satan. It says, he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth. This is talking about Satan. He does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Satan has no truth. He may give you scripture. He may even whisper things in your ear to bring you under guilt and condemnation using the word of God. He did that with Jesus, but he has no understanding of truth in itself. It says when he speaks, this is when Satan speaks. Now these are, this is red letter edition. He's telling us and telling the people there that Satan has a voice and he speaks. If you turn on the news, you turn on some of these programs, you can hear the voice of Satan in those programs, in, those, in, the, in the news broadcasts. You need to watch out what you're listening to. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. So who is the father or the author of lies? Satan is. If there is a lie going on, the very root of it is the devil. And we have truth. In verse 45, Jesus said, Because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. So many times we've gotten used to lies. And if and if we hear something contrary to that, such as, By grace you're saved through faith, not of yourselves, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's the scripture. But we, but we hear that and we think, I don't know if that's really true. That's too good to be true. Um, that God blesses us, that he doesn't hold anything against us. We think, how can that be true? Look at what I've done. Look at who I am. Let's look at Jesus. Let's look at the Father. I heard Gloria Copeland say one time how there were lies about she and Kenneth, that people had, had told lies about them. And she said, with all these different lies that have been told about us, it's nothing compared to the lies that have been told about God and about Jesus, that, that God is tired of us, that he, that he, well, all kinds of lies, that he doesn't heal, that he may not save you. If you're not good enough, if you don't deserve the blessings of God, forget it. You're not going to get it. You have to do these things and work it to deserve it. You know, and churches are full of that. Many times churches will put guilt and condemnation to try to motivate people to give, to motivate people to work in the church, to motivate people just to quit sinning. And they'll lie to them to try to get them out of things or to get them to do something for them or to give money. And lying is never fruitful because Satan is the author of all lies. He's called the father of lies. He births lies out of his own loins. That's what he reproduces is lies. So don't listen to these lies. Don't listen to it anymore. If, you've hear, if you're hearing the truth about yourself, that you're complete in Christ, that um, no weapon formed against you prospers, and yet fear tries to come upon you thinking this is going to happen, that's going to happen, these are bad times, these are hard times, don't buy those lies with your mouth. Just say, I'm not believing that lie. That's not true. I, we had a, a lady in our church. She's a precious lady. And... Doris was um, going to go to the doctor. Her husband insisted. She had some symptoms on her. He insisted. She went ahead and had tests. So she went ahead and went to the doctor. 
And so he ran tests and then afterwards you get the results and you sit in the office and they're across from you at the desk and they're explaining to you what these tests have said. Well, after she listened to him, she said, well, that's a lie. She's telling the doctor who has gone through college, many colleges probably, has a lot of degrees, all these things, everything under his belt. He's full of wisdom and knowledge and information. They've run tests and they've given the results of these tests and he's sharing this now with her. And now she looks at him and she says, well, that's a lie. Smartest thing she ever could have done. She got a report that would have been life-threatening for her. And yet she opened her mouth and she said, that's a lie. And the doctor got kind of funny with her. And she said, I believe the word of God. Well, you can believe what you want, but these tests, this is what they're saying. You know, there are two voices in this world. You have a negative report. And I'm not saying there's not sickness and disease. I'm not saying that there's not maybe financial um, information that's coming to you that might be factual. But you don't have to take it as truth for you. You do not have to embrace it. You don't have to live in it because that's not what God has for you. And so she went ahead and she said, well, that's a lie. And he got a little huffy with her and she went ahead and got huffy back and she stood up and she was nice. She didn't have to, you know, you don't have to be mean, but you do need to open your mouth and not accept that. If you have a um, word that is spoken about your children, some uh, maybe something about them not being able to learn very well or having these different initials they come up with sicknesses for children and such and you don't have to accept that those are words and the Bible says that Satan is the father of lies but Jesus is the author of all truth in him is truth he is truth he has truth he wants to bring you truth today so open up your Bibles and find out what he says about you and about your situation about your children you know that your your children are disciples taught of the Lord and great is their peace if they can't sleep at night or they're fretful or they're just angry, you pray over them and then you start speaking what the word says about them, not what a doctor's report says, not what other people are saying, but you speak the truth over them with your mouth. That's how you release your faith. So in John chapter 10, and we're familiar with this verse, but it's right next door in John 10, 10, it says, the thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy the thief it's referring to here is Satan and he comes to do three things he comes to steal so that's what he wants to do is rob you he wants to kill he is that he is the taker of life and he wants to destroy he comes with destruction so killing stealing and destruction all come from the devil and then Jesus said at the end of that verse um, I have come so he said he just gave this picture of why Satan is coming to steal, kill, and destroy. And then he said, but I have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. What did, what did Jesus come to bring? If it's killing, stealing, and, destro and destroying, it is not from God ever. He is not allowing it. Someone had said to me that, that nothing comes to me but what it passes through God first excuse me that is an error I don't care who said it what it where people get that from that is not the truth and and if that's how you have felt or if you've even said that that something everything has to pass through God in order to get to you and so you're going to embrace what comes to you because you think God is working things out for you Satan came to kill steal and destroy that's what his works do all sickness all disease all pain all lack all confusion, all strife, all comes from the enemy. But Jesus said, I am come that you might have life and you might have it more abundantly. Well, if everything passes through God that gets to you, has to come through him first, and you get sick, does that mean it's God's will that you be sick? No. He said, I, you know, beloved, I pray above all things that you may prosper and be healthy. That is the will of God. Jesus came to show the will of the Father to mankind. He never put sickness on someone. He never turned anybody down. He brought health, healing, restoration all the time. Every place Jesus went, there was abundance. When he threw a party and he took a boy's fish and, and loaves, 
he went ahead and he multiplied it and there were 12 basketfuls left of leftovers. That means when he supplies, he does it with more abundance. This verse said, Jesus said, I am come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. This is this abundant life he has for you and for me. See, God is a big God. See him as able to answer all prayers at the same time. He is powerful. He's magnificent. Don't, don't cut it short on what you need because you think that, oh, this isn't that important. God, that's too many things. God has all these people worldwide praying constantly, constantly for him to do this, to do that. And mine, just a little thing. There's plenty of room for you in Father's house. God cares about your needs. He cares about your families. He cares about your physical bodies. He wants you well. He wants your family doing well. So accept that. Praise God. It is the truth. So there's been a lot of misinformation that's caused needless work, financial pain, and, and a waste of money, a waste of time, creating fear. Don't get into that. Let's go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 7 with me. Thank you, Jesus. Matthew 7. I know where this is. I don't have it marked yet in my Bible today, but it's right here. Matthew 7. And we'll start with verse 24. And Jesus told the story to the disciples. And he said, Therefore, whoever hears these things of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. So what does he say? He says, those that hear these sayings of his and does them, acts on them. It says, he will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. Are we going to build our lives? That's what this house represents. It's not a building that you live in, but your life. Are you going to build your life on a rock? Or then he says in verse 25, and it talks about this man, talks about situations in life and the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it did not fail or fall for it was founded on the rock good news story there you have stuff that happens you have winds you have storms that come against you against your family against your nation wherever you are all of these things try to come and remember, we just read that Satan comes to kill, steal, and destroy. So guess where those storms come from? What is the root of it? But and he said, I came to give life and life abundantly. But he says to those that are doers of the word, that believe the word of God, he said that when the winds blew and beat on that house, it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. And then verse 26, But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them, will be like a foolish man. You know, I don't want to be a foolish person. And I know you don't either. But he says, somebody who hears these words and doesn't put them into action, doesn't believe them, will be like a fool who built his house on the sand. Now, we live about an hour and a half from the beach. And we live about 15 minutes from the desert area where there's a lot of sand. And you don't see very many homes built on that sand at all. In fact, if they do build a home where it's sandy, they have to dig deep and find some good solid rock to build a good strong home on. So we don't want to be a fool on where, how we build our house. Verse 27 says, And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house. Which house? The one built on the sand. And it fell. And great was its fall. It doesn't say it just collapsed a little bit. It says, great was its fall. Oh my goodness. These are the same winds, the same floods, the same waters, the same opposition of these two homes or these two people. One listened to what the sayings of Jesus were and acted on them. Does it say there were, there, so therefore there weren't any more floods? Now, if you believe that God is allowing things to come upon your life to teach you something or so you can have a greater understanding, then you'll never resist those things like you should. 
and you need to resist. It says, draw nigh unto God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. It doesn't even say it's, he's going to flee from God. It's he's going to flee from you when you resist the devil. You need to understand you have good God and you have bad devil. You resist evil. You resist bad sickness, disease, lack, confusion. You resist it in the name of Jesus. All pain, you resist that in Jesus' name because God is always good. He brings goodness to us. So you need to know what to resist. Now, if you think that God is allowing or God is bringing sickness, disease, pain, confusion, lack, all of those things on you to teach or in your home, your family to teach you something, you're not going to resist God. Not if you love Jesus. You're not going to resist God. Oh my goodness. I read this book and it was saying, praise God for everything. This was this man's teaching was to praise God for everything. Just bring it on. Bring it on. I can handle this. I'm going to learn from this. Bring it on. And you know what he finally learned? He learned he should have been resisting it. And when I read that book, I was thanking God for this and thanking God for that. Thanks God. Did never, he never did. And I was... I was believing a lie that these things were allowed by God and we need to realize the truth that God does not open the doors and say, go ahead, just, you know, this is my servant, they can handle this or this is going to make them stronger. That's not true. Our strength comes from God and we need to get that straight. Good God, bad devil. Just keep that straight. Let's get back to this story built on the rock. So this is a man who hears the sayings of Jesus, two men that hear the sayings of Jesus, and one of them does them. In other words, he believes the word of God. If you see in the word of God where it says to draw an eye unto God, resist the devil, and he flees, that's a really good one. And you say, okay, I'm going to do that. I'm going to draw close to God. I'm going to worship God, and I'm going to resist everything from the devil. And the devil will flee from me. He has to take up these things and run run from me. And you believe that and you act on it. It says, this man is like the one who is wise and built his home, his house, his life on the rock. And even when the rain descended and even when the winds blew and the floods came and beat on that person's house, on your own life, you say, okay, that may happen. Satan tries to come. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy. He does come, but it's not going to do what it, what it says, it, what he wants it to do. It says that it did not fall, even though it beat on your house, on your life. It did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. What is your foundation? Do you love God? I believe you do. Do you is your foundation the word of God for everything before you invest do you go to the word of God do you listen to your spirit is this wise is this a good investment before you are training your children or or choosing a different uh, job a different occupation are you going to God and asking for wisdom how about finding a mate a husband or a wife or what school you're going to go to all these different things Life has so many decisions to make, but when you go ahead and you ha put the Word of God in you and you seek God, you will always know what to do because God, the Bible says, will never leave you or forsake you. He doesn't turn His back on you. He said He would be with us always to help us in everything. So you're building your house on a rock and when those problems come, it says, it did not fall. It could not fall. I love that. It could not fall. For it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these things of mine. So here you have the other Christian person. Who hears the word of God. Hears these sayings. And does not do them. And why doesn't he do them? Because he thinks, oh that's not for today. Or that couldn't be true. Or I'm not sure about this. I've heard I've heard this, this, and this. I've heard other people say things. And they're, they seem to be doing well. They seem to be so happy. But what does the word of God say? And I want to challenge you to find out what God is saying to you. Praise God. So you hear these sayings. And this one says, and does not do them. He will be like a foolish man who built his house or his life on the sand. And the rain descended. The same rain that, that descended on the wise person. The floods came. The same floods that descended and came upon the wise person. And the winds blew and beat on that house. Now, this is a house of a foolish man who didn't believe the word of God and it fell 
and great was its fall. Oh, final words of that story, great was its fall. I don't want to have that said about me. I don't want to have that said about you. I want to see you doing well and succeeding and being an overcomer. Praise God. So I'd like to go ahead and read a couple of those verses that we just read out of um, some different translations. So we are in Matthew chapter 7 and looking at verse 24. I want to read this to you out of the Message Bible. I thought it was just so interesting how they put that, how they put this in the Message Bible. Jesus said, These words I speak to you are not incidental additions to your life. Don't think this is just a little bit of the decorations to make my life look good. They're not home homeowner improvements to your standard of living. <laughs> I thought, oh, that's really good. They are foundational words. His words are foundational words to words to build a life on. If you work these words into your life, you are like a smart carpenter who built his house on solid rock. Rain poured down, the river flooded, or tornado hit, but nothing moved that house. It was fixed on the rock. But if you just use my words in Bible studies and don't work them into your life, you are like a stupid carpenter who built his house on the sandy beach. When a storm rolled in and the waves came up, it collapsed like a house of cards. Ouch. Okay, so let's go ahead and also I'd like to read that to you out of the Passion Translation. It's good to see different translations because it shows you how to apply the Word of God. In verse 24, the Passion Translation, everyone who hears my teaching and applies it to his life, get that, hears it but applies it to his life, can be compared to a wise man who built his house on an unshakable foundation. Ooh, I like that. When the rains fell and the floods came, with fierce winds beating upon his house, it stood firm because of its strong foundation. What are you building your life on? What God says? I hope so. But everyone who hears my teaching and does not apply it to his life can be compared to a foolish man who built his house on the sand. When it rained and rained and the flood came, with wind and waves beating upon his house, it collapsed and was swept away. Let's go ahead and build our lives on what God says. What does it mean to do the word? It means to accept it, to embrace it, to believe the word of God, to build that house is so important. In um, Psalm 119, let's go ahead and look that one up. In Psalm 119, I want to start off with the New King James Version. And verse 105, I'm going to have to scroll down a little bit here. Praise God for these wonderful devices we have and for the written word of God for us. In the New King James, it says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Your word is a lamp to my feet. Now, we can't quite understand what that means, except we get it when we have um, turned the lamps on. It's because it's dark. As a little kid, um, I was always running down the hallway. It was a long, dark hallway, and I had heard about monsters and all these things and the, and the dark, and I didn't like the dark, and so, and I was probably teased because I was running to my room, and, and it was just, you never knew what you might step on. There was a, a beautiful carved um, piece of uh, furniture in that hallway, and, and I would catch my little toe on it so many times, I would do not a happy dance, but I was trying to run down the hallway. And then when I started having kids, I ha we had this hallway and so many times there were toys left in the hall. And so I'm going down the hallway in the dark because I wasn't allowed to turn the light on when I was growing up. And I guess I wasn't going to do it as an adult. And I would step on a toy. Oh, those little tiny cars, those little matchbox cars, those metal ones, they hurt when you're barefooted going down the hall. And I wasn't doing a happy dance then either. But you have light and a light shows you where you're going. Well, they would actually have these little tiny oil lamps, little, little, just a little one, that they would attach to the top of their shoe. 
and it would and they would light it and when they would walk it in the dark in the dark darkness it would be a lamp for their feet for one step at a time and here it's written in the book of Psalms your word is a lamp unto my feet his word is like a lamp a little light for every individual step you know God cares about your little decisions he cares about every step you take and he wants you to have a light well lit he doesn't want you stepping on something that's going to hurt you or getting off from the path he says thy word here he says is a is a lamp unto my feet and then not just for each step but a light unto my path a path is the direction you're going and this and in the book of psalms it's talking about how god's word shows us one step at a time and he also lights the whole path the whole direction to take not just a daily stepping but also for the future where you're headed where you're going his word will give you wisdom will show you where to go how to head out on these things and then um, in um, the passion translation for those same verses it says truth's shining light guides me in my choices and decisions who isn't that good god's word is a shining light that guides me that guides me in my choices and decisions the revelation of your word makes my pathway clear you need you want to go know where you're heading where you want to go what you should do it says that his word the revelation of god's word makes our pathway pathways clear and then just one more i'd like to go ahead and do it in the message bible in psalm 105 i mean psalm 119 verse 105 by your words i can see where i'm going is that clear his word will show you where you're going they throw a beam of light on my dark path i've committed myself and i'll never turn back from living by your righteous order god's word is a light and a lamp for you and me his word you take this word and you get direction you open up your bible and you find light all the time jesus is our light he is our revelation he is our light and you get the word of god not just a a bible study here and there not just a um a reading a little devotional i love devotionals i love the verse for today but these are words to live by I love to go to Bible studies and be in church, but it isn't just to, to hear a good sermon, a good message, but it's to embrace it and to do something with it, to let it become part of your life and let it to be a lamp for your feet and a light for your path to give direction, to let you know where you're going. Praise God. By your words, I can see where I'm going. Can you see where you're going today? They throw a beam of light on your dark path. There's darkness and there's things going on in our lives right now that we need light on. And God's word will give you direction. Don't be like me. I was had misinformation and spent a lot of time, a lot of effort. Say, well, that was just two days. It was two days I needed. Many hours I needed to spend elsewhere. Instead, I had misinformation with cleaning out my cupboards to get sprayed for bugs. And the good news is the answer gone. Praise God. That's a really good news. I didn't give that report at the beginning. But when you go ahead and hear misinformation, it's a time waster. And let's take the word of God because God doesn't waste time. Time spent in his word is not wasted time. It's valuable. It's preparation time for a life and a future and a hope that he has for you. So let's pray together before we close today. Father, I thank you for the truth of your word. I thank you for giving us direction and showing us where we should go, how we can go, how to follow your voice. Your word is a lamp and it's a light. And Father, for those that would let it be their lamp and their light, I pray for those today. If anybody's listening today and you don't know if you believe, if you're born again, if you're part of God's family, the Bible says, believe on Jesus and you will be saved. Believe what? That he died for your sin that he was resurrected and that he's your Lord you believe that 
And the Bible says you are born into God's family. You're, God didn't make it difficult. He kept it simple so everybody could partake and be part of what he's doing on this earth right now. Welcome into the family of God. Just pray this prayer. Say, I believe, Jesus, that you died for me. I believe you were raised from the dead and you are my Lord. I'm going to study your word. I'm going to follow after you. And so I hope you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. How do you do that? You say, Father, fill me with your spirit. I receive the gift of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. I receive this empowerment to live this life for you, Lord, in Jesus' name. So I hope you've prayed that prayer. I hope you have, have believed on the Lord Jesus. But let's get into the Word of God. This is your everyday manual for life. So get into the Word of God, study it, let it become a part of you, value the Word of God because it is so rich with the things God has for you to show you how to live life and how to succeed in everything that you do. Have a really blessed week. I'm going to have a blessed one. And thank you for joining me. We'll catch you next time. God bless you.